All right, so this week we're talking about diseases and insects uh, because they, they generally are the thing uh, when people are vegetable gardening that I get the most questions about. So our, our goals for the week are to identify some of the common causes, symptoms, uh, prevention and treatment measures that you can take when you're working with vegetable plants and to identify the common insect pests and also what some of the beneficial insects are. So uh, sickness is a part of life. People get sick, animals get sick, and guess what? Plants have diseases and health issues as well. Some common disease symptoms, failure to germinate, uh, death shortly after germination, abnormal growth, split stems, leaf problems. If you see any unusual things going on with leaves, if they're stunted or distorted, if they have spots, if they're wilting or if they're decaying, that's usually an indication that you may have a disease of some sort. Some common sources of plant problems, uh, environmental, physical. Think about, think about last February, did we have uh, environmental issues? Yeah, we had a freeze. <laughs> a big freeze. And our plants had no, no lead into that. There was no acclimation prior to that freeze. So we had, we had damage to things here that did not receive damage in other parts of the state because um, those other places have had lo lots of cool nights and, and several, you know, minor freezes and stuff before that big freeze came. We had had nothing. So our plants were still in full, full growing patterns when, when things hit. <clears throat> and a lot of people had already put out tomatoes. Um, a lot of people here put out tomatoes in February. Uh, trying to get them uh, to produce as much as they can before our summer heat sets in. And uh, unfortunately, that was not good that uh, last year. And then um, also uh, pathogens or biotics. You all are probably very aware that our soils are full of all kinds of pathogens and all kinds of living things as well. So, And then high humidity and cold temperatures. Our high humidity is a perfect situation for funguses to uh, take hold. So we have to do what we can to try to make sure that we're watering properly and all that to avoid um, setting off a fungal attack. Uh, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about fun fungus, fungi or funguses, bacteria, viruses, and a little bit about nematodes. <coughs> so a fungus, <coughs> why they're a problem? They disrupt the water transport and if the water transport is disrupted, then that disrupts the nutrient transport. Uh, some common types of fungus, powder mildew, damping off. That's when you have seedlings and the fungus attacks the stem and it kills the seedling. Uh, mold is a fungus. Wilt. Um, we have types of rust that we get on plants. We're not talking about the rust that you see on metal, but there are um, funguses called rust that are on plants. Canker and then blight. And here's an example in the picture that I believe is uh, some kind of gourd and it's got uh, powdery mildew on it. You'll recognize powdery mildew because it's kind of this white, um, nasty looking stuff. So a little bit about powdery mildew. It's white or gray powdery coating, usually on the leaves, but may affect other parts of the plant as well. So it's not limited to just the leaves, but that's where it prefers is to be on the leaves. Uh, cucurbits especially are especially susceptible. You guys know what cucurbits are? We're talking about cantaloupes and watermelons and uh, cucumbers and all of those types of plants. It may kill the leaves or plants in severe cases. Uh, in the pictures, uh, you've got a picture of a crepe myrtle on the left. In the center, you have grapes and then you have uh, looks like some type of holly or or maybe that's a cucurbit of some sort. Damping off. Uh, the seedlings die shortly after sprouting. They uh, appear not to germinate sometimes. Uh, commonly caused by funguses Pythium and Phytophthora and Rhizoctonia. Uh, they're prevalent under cool moist conditions uh, especially if you if you do not keep the watering consistent. So uh, in each of these pictures, you'll see where you've got areas in each one of these flats of, of new vegetable seedlings where um, the plants have died off. And then uh, this is 
damping off right here in this middle picture where it's attacked the base of the stem and actually caused it to die. Then you have bacterial uh, problems. Usually it results in wilting and death. Uh, symptoms appear in the older leaves first. It's easily spread by splashing water, insects, tools, and uh, even can spread through the soil. So there's a couple of pictures that show bacterial issues. The first one is bacterial wilt, and the second one is soft rot on lettuce. I, I've seen this a few times. I've gotten uh, lettuce from the store and had this in, inside the package of lettuce. It's not normally visible till you actually open the package, but uh, they do a, a pretty good job for the most part of keeping this at bay. So you hardly ever see anything like this. Um, with bacteria, if you have a bacterial infection, it's very important to uh, clean and disinfect your tools in, when you're moving from one plant to another because it can be easily spread from just uh, your tools touching an infected plant and then you translocate it over to the uninfected plant. Um, a good disinfectant is a 10% bleach solution. So you can put that in a spray bottle and you just spray your tools before you move on to the next one. Here are what viruses look like. Uh, they usually cause yellowing or mottling of the leaves. Uh, they cause stunted growth, usually spread by insects. So an insect will, ju just like our viruses that you think about, West Nile virus, malaria, um, it's, it's spread easily from insects. The common vector in those are mosquitoes. The common vectors in these are whatever insects happen to be feeding on the plants. And so uh, there's no cure or treatment. If you have a plant that's infected, it's usually just pull it up and discard it. So in the first one, you have a toma tomato plant that has tobacco mosaic virus. On the second one, uh, you have a uh, leaf curl pepper leaf curl virus, which is very common. We see this quite often when we've got pepper plants out. So if you've got weird leaves on your pepper plant, it's probably got a virus. And then there's a fan leaf virus on grapevine. Nematodes. Nematodes are actually microscopic worms uh, that are in the soil. There are beneficial nematodes and there are harmful nematodes. So um, don't, I don't want you to think when you hear the word nematodes that all nematodes are bad because they're not. There are actually some really good nematodes. But in this case, we're focusing on nematodes that attack vegetables. Um, so you can see what they do to the tomato plants. And then in the center, you have carrots that have been attacked by nematodes. Um, there are a couple of things that you can do to help reduce the risk of nematodes. They are naturally occurring in the soil. So all we're trying to do is not ramp up their populations to where they cause uh, you know, huge amounts of problems for our vegetables. One of the things that you can do is to rotate your crops. In other words, if you know you have nematode susceptible vegetables, you don't put them in the same location twice in a row. So move them around to a different place each year that you plant. And then there's a product called diatomaceous earth. It's actually the skeletons of uh, small crustacean sea creatures. Uh, so it's basically shells, tiny, tiny, tiny shells. And you uh, put that into the soil or around the base of the plant. And uh, the worms, as they crawl across it, uh, cut themselves up and it kills them. So that's diatomaceous earth. And how many uh, you recognize the word diatom from science class? Anybody remember that? Anyway, that refers to a um, tiny sea creature with an exoskeleton. And then prevention is always um, the best thing that you can do. Buy resistant varieties. If you look, go to the store, you're going to see some letters on the vegetable tags. Uh, things like uh, TV, um, F, they're going fusarium. <coughs> These are all things that indicate uh, what types of things they're resistant to. There is no 100% resistance, but there are plants that offer more resistance than, than others. Uh, consider what your climate is and try to buy, buy plants that are very suited for the climate. Plant at the appropriate times. Uh, try to keep out weeds. Weeds often have uh, provide cover for insects and sometimes other diseases as well. Remove disease or damaged plants. Control pests, 
uh, they can be vectors. So we don't want them moving from an infected plant to an uninfected plant, so get rid of them. And then companion plants. Do you guys know what companion plants are? They're things that you put into the bed that actually offer a level of protection. Uh, an example would be marigolds. How many of you remember your, your mom or your grandma or your grandpa putting marigolds in and around their vegetables? Uh, that's because the marigolds have a strong fragrance and um, they believe that it warded off some of the bad insects from coming into the vegetables. So um, there are some really good companion plant lists out there that tell you if you're growing this, then you should put this out. If you're growing this, you should put this out. I'll try to email you one of those companion plant lists, Paul. And then okay. encourage, encourage beneficials. Our first line of defense is always to allow the natural predators to take care of the problem. So we want to do things to try to make it better for them. Um, and going out there with the chemicals immediately is probably one of the worst things we can do because that kills both the good and the bad. And then again, like I said, it's important to learn to recognize what are my good insects and which ones are my bad insects. You can also use row covers. It is a uh, basically a piece of um, fabric, not like fabric that you sew with, but it's a piece of garden fabric that goes over the vegetables and, and provides a little bit of protection. It allows water and sunlight to come in, but it, it provides a barrier to insects. Uh, same thing with um, airflow. It's important to make sure that you're planting things the correct distance apart or that you're um, planting them in an area where there's air circulation. The more air circulation is, there is, the less likely you're going to get a fungal infection. So, and then mulch. Mulch helps keep weeds down and it also breaks down in, into um, good organic matter as it's uh, breaking down. And sanitize your tools, keep them clean and then uh, proper water and nutrition. So let's talk a little bit about insects. Um, I want you to take a look at the pictures on the left. Uh, who can tell me what is the uh, red and black insect that you see there? A ladybug. A ladybug or a ladybird beetle. Uh, what about the insect on the far right that's on the leaf? Is it a love bug? It's also a ladybug. That's the larval stage of the ladybug. So uh, it's important to learn. Um, most people, if they saw that, would go, oh, that's a bad bug, and they would squish it. It's actually not. This is the stage that actually eats the most, is this larval stage. And then you have a, pu a pupa stage. If you look in the middle, you'll see that you have the adult ladybug. The adult ladybug lays her eggs. And then the eggs hatch into a larva, and then they go into a pupa, and then they emerge back out as an adult. And I hope that picture is big enough that you guys can see it. So, like I said, it's important to know all the stages, not just the adult stage. And that way, you'll go, oh, good, I've got ladybugs coming. So, uh, some beneficial insects. Beneficial insects help uh, plants. In some way, they can be predators. They also can be insect parasites or they can be pollinators. So they don't all have to just eat. Some of them just move the pollen and stuff around. So here's some examples. Um, if you look at the bottom left, you've got a praying mantis and he is a voracious eater. He has a big appetite and will eat just about anything. So if you see those, they're scary, but they're actually a beneficial insect. So don't get freaked out by it. Just uh, move out of its way or, or let it go on its way. How many of you knew that dragonflies uh, ate, were one of the primary insects that eat mosquitoes? So it's good to encourage dragonflies to be in your garden. Um, how many of you uh, like spiders? Said no one ever, right? Okay, spiders are actually been they're not an insect, but we include them with insects because they're very beneficial. Um, spiders do a great job of catching insects and, and eating them. So um, what we generally encourage people to do, rather than squishing the spider, 
if it's outside now you can do whatever you want to if, it, if it's dumb enough to come in your house you can do whatever you want to with it but if it's outside just get a broom or a stick knock the web down and the spider will move on somewhere else and build the web some in other some other part of your garden um unless it's a poisonous spider if it's a poisonous spider you have to do whatever you got to do okay and then here's an example uh this picture at the top that shows the uh, the worm or the caterpillar this is an example of a parasitic wasp and the parasitic wasp uh lays its eggs inside of the caterpillar the eggs hatch and they eat the caterpillar from the inside out it's like a really bad horror movie so like aliens like aliens you're right so uh, it's important to learn to to notice the damage that insects do uh, if you see anything unusual um, it's probably going to be from uh, insects so some things that you might look for are damage to all or part of the plant. Look for frass. Do you remember last week we, we used the word frass and that means insect poop, basically? Insect caca, whatever you want to call it, okay? And then evidence of chewing, holes, trails or streaks, spots, galls. A gall is a swollen, air, swollen area. It's usually caused by something chewing on it and injecting some sort of enzyme that causes a reaction from the plant where it swells up. Uh, we see galls on oak trees quite often. And then damage from sucking insects. Usually if it's a sucking insect, it's going to leave a sticky residue behind. So if you see sticky stuff on the plant, it's a pretty good sign that you've got sucking insects there of some sort. Uh, and if it's wilting, it's a good sign that it's either diseased or it's got um, some sort of <coughs> insects that have attacked it. <clears throat> some and there's even some ants that will cut ants and caterpillars that will cut the plants off completely at ground level here's a picture of aphids the little black ones down here in the corner there are lots of different colors of aphids there's red and yellow and green and white and black so there are lots of different forms of aphids none of them are good insects they're all bad here is a leaf cutter ant uh, we actually have a lot of people that call about leafcutter ants and leafcutter bees. We have a lot of bees that uh, come in and cut little round circle, ho circular holes in the edges of leaves. Uh, they like rose leaves especially. And in the top picture, that is a tomato hornworm. They're about, they can be upwards of three inches long. So they're a very large caterpillar. Uh, you guys know the, uh, the giant moths that fly around the porch lights at night, that is the caterpillar of, of that moth. And they, they can totally strip all the leaves off of a tomato plant, a big tomato plant in a single night. So you wanna watch for these guys. Uh, and by the way, chickens love them. So if you find them, chunk them to the chickens cause the chickens love them. But they're, they're one of our, our bad ones. Grasshoppers, beetles, and leafhoppers can quickly devour or damage your plants. Grasshoppers are serious pests of cereal, vegetables, and pasture plants. Uh, beetles. Oh, by the way, the Bible, it talks about locusts, uh, about these big uh, swarms of locusts. And when you hear them talking about locusts, it's usually a swarm of, big, of grasshoppers is usually what it is. Um, there are serious pests. Beetles contain members that are both beneficial and harmful. So not all beetles are bad. In fact, more beetles are good than are bad. So you just have to figure out which ones are the bad guys. And the leaf hoppers suck sap from grass trees and other plants. So here on the left, uh, you have a leaf hopper. And then in the middle, you've got examples of some different kinds of beetles. And then on the right, you've got a grasshopper. Snails and slugs. You've got a picture of a snail. A uh, snail does not have a shell. I mean, a snail has a shell. A slug does not have a sh shell. They're gastropods. Snails, oh, I already said that. Uh, snails feed on plants by filing away uh, plant particles with their radulae, which is basically their grinding mouth parts. They just basically think about a sander and what a sander does. That's what snails and slugs do is they sit there and they just grind away and digest. 
And then uh, slugs function very similarly to snails because they, but they have no shell, which makes them more advanced. They're able to squeeze through areas that a snail can't get its shell to go. So slugs are uh, advanced and, and actually are able to move around quite easily. You'll always know that you've got them if you look for slime trails. And then small round holes in the middle leaves. Uh, they cannot support themselves on the edge of a leaf, they have to crawl up onto the leaf to eat. So if you have holes in the middle of a leaf, there's a good chance. And if you have holes and you see slime trails, it's going to be snails or slugs. Uh, thankfully, there's some really good baits out there for snails and slugs. They're uh, not too hard to control. So caterpillars, uh, they're the larvae of members of Lepidoptera, which is the family that has moths and butterflies. They are voracious eaters. It is the caterpillar stage that does all the damage and they have chewing mouth parts. It's a hard to believe that, that something as ugly as a caterpillar can turn into a beautiful butterfly, beautiful butterfly sometimes. So if you look, I've given you some common examples. These are army worms. So this is what the army worm looks like as a caterpillar. And that's what the army worm uh, moth looks like. And then I told you, the big guy that flies around the porch light at night, that's a type of sphinx moth. And uh, that's what it looks like as the tomato hornworm. And then here's what your fall webworm looks like. And then here is the picture of them in the caterpillar stage. Leaf miners, they're the larvae of moths and sawflies and flies that selectively eat layers of tissue within a leaf. So they crawl in and they eat it from the inside out. So you see these weird trails throughout the leaf. You can see on the tomato plant on the left. And then here are some snow peas that, that a leaf miner has gotten into. And then here is a nasturtium over on the right. They're protected within the leaf and uh, they're difficult to control because you can't spray anything on them and get rid of them because they're protected by the leaf surface. So uh, usually if we have a lot, if I have a few of them, I don't worry about them. If I've got a lot, I usually pick off the really bad leaves and leave the good leaves. White flies are hemipterans. They have sucking, piercing mouth parts they will always be feeding on the bottom side of the leaf. So they don't feed on the top, they feed on the bottom. They are a vector of viruses and they are very difficult to control. <coughs> In the picture on the left, this is what the adult white flies look like. These are the veins of the tomato leaf. So you can see how small they actually are. They're a very small insect. And if you have a, a really large infestation of white flies, uh, when you shake the plant or walk through the plants, uh, it actually, they, they, enough of them just lodge and fly around that it actually looks kind of like a cloud of insects. So that's the way it is. And here are, are what the eggs look like. And then here you have a beneficial beetle who is eating those eggs. And here is a, a close up of the insect um, egg. Scale. Scale are small sucking insects. They attach themselves permanently to a plant, usually um, at the joint where a leaf attaches to the stem. Uh, they have a very waxy coating, which makes it hard for chemicals to kill them. Um, and there also are not that many predators that go after them. So there are lots of different colors of scale as well. So keep in mind. And so here's a stem. You can see the size of scale is relatively small as well. Mealybugs. Mealybugs are kind of cottony looking and uh, they are, are able to produce live um, offspring and they do not have to be fertilized. So they are able to produce thousands and thousands of live offspring without actually ever having to mate with a partner. So it's really crazy. Um, they secrete a waxy layer for protection. The young may be born from eggs or directly from the female. Spider mites, uh, these are actually a mite, but they actually do produce a little webbing and where they can travel across easily from leaf to leaf. Uh, they will make it look like it's been sandblasted. So if it's kind of gritty and sandblasted looking, chances are it's spider mites. 
One of the easiest things that you can do for spider mites is to hose down the plant, give it a good washing with just a spray of water from time to time. And that seems to help uh, prevent spider mites. And then here's some uh, aphids. Aphids also can be sexual or asexual. They, they can give live birth to clones basically. And they have symbiosis. It's been shown that they have symbiosis, a symbiotic relationship with ants. They actually, the ants will farm them uh, because they like the sticky residue that the aphids leave behind. So the ants will protect the aphids uh, from predators. Uh, sometimes people called them lice. They're not a true, true lice though. Pest control should always be uh, using a, just use common sense, use resistant varieties, follow good integrated pest management principles, uh, encourage beneficials. Did you know that you can buy beneficials online? You can buy um, lace wings, you can buy ladybugs, you can buy all kinds of stuff, parasitic wasps to release out into your garden. So if you wanna to try to go uh, chemical free, it is possible to use other means to do that. And then use companion plants and always use chemicals as a very last resort. Some resistant varieties. Like I said, you've got tags on the vegetables and they'll, you'll see these different letters. There's V, F, 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 N, A, T, S, T, S, T, S, W, B. And these all stand for these different diseases or viruses that, that the plant is resistant to. Not every one of them, there, there's none of them that have all of these resistances. You'll see some of these letters on the tags. So keep a lookout for those. Then uh, integrated pest management principles, monitor and establish a threshold. How much are, are you willing to put up with before you actually have to do something? I always give the beneficial insects at least a few days to try to kick in and start taking care of the problem. And most of the time they do. Um, practice good cultural practices, keep the weeds down, keep, keep mulch down, do things that you can to try to make uh, the environment as, as favorable for your vegetable plants as possible use biologicals or beneficials as much as possible. You can always use a pair of clippers uh, or you can pull up really diseased plants. Like I was talking about pinching off some of the bad leaves when we were talking about leaf miners and then chemical control should be your very last option. So beneficials, uh, when you, if you decide to order beneficials in, uh, make sure that you have a water source for them. Usually before I release them out, I'm going to take the hose and I'm going to spray down the area that I want them to stay in because think about it. <coughs> They've been shipped through the mail and they're probably thirsty and hungry as soon as they get out of the container. Makes sense, right? And then remember that if you decide to spray, it's going to kill your beneficials. It's going to kill your good bugs and your bad bugs. So keep that in mind. And then here's an example of companion plants. Uh, these are marigolds. They put them in with this chard to try to help deter uh, the insects that might feed on chard. And then chemicals should be your last resort. Uh, by the way, just because they use the word organic does not mean that it's uh, chemical free. There are lots of organic chemicals. So uh, organic just means that it it's naturally occurring from a live source or from a live, what was once alive. And always read the label if you decide to go with chemicals. And finally, expect the unexpected. There's always gonna be things that are gonna be surprises. Uh, go the flow, you'll figure it out or you can find somebody that knows what to tell you what to do. Any questions? No. That was a lot of stuff, wasn't it? Interesting. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, where is the stop? Oh.